Now that is probably the most expensive way that I can spend an afternoon. Now believe it or not, outside of paying for machines and metal, which is something that I try to keep to a minimum, emeralds are probably at the top of my list of expenses when it comes to running a small hobby machine shop. In fact, what I have here are my most recent pickups of 10mm cutters, which is the most common size that I use in the workshop. I found that 10mm is a good trade-off between price, size, strength and versatility, at least for the projects that I do and the machines that I have. Now I'm currently trying out a few different brands, but even at the low end, they're not what you'd call cheap. I mean in fairness, compared to a well-priced drill bit, they aren't as bad, but it's always difficult to compare the two, even though they both look similar. A drill's one job is to drill holes, which means it needs two sharp cutting edges at the tip and two flutes to evacuate the chips. And obviously, they aren't designed for milling. Okay, so they do cut better than I thought, which was not what I was expecting, but still, they're not made for milling. Even so, the flutes are ground, but they shouldn't be expecting to get much wear. And even when drill bits get blunt, getting them sharp again is a two minute job, either at the bench grinder or using a dedicated tool. And the same thing goes for if you snap it, you just recreate the cutting edge from what's left. End mills on the other hand, need to cut on the bottom and on the side. And unlike a hole where the finish is hidden or can be improved by a reamer, the finish left by an end mill is on display. They also require different, more complex geometry compared to a drill bit, with more cutting edges to grind in and sharpen. And unless you have a tool and cutter grinder, or a jig with a surface grinder, good luck resharpening them to an acceptable standard. All of that pretty much means if you break the tool, it's game over. If you shear off a flute, it's game over. If you burn up or blunten the bottom edge, it's game over. They're not like a lathe tool where you can simply re-grind or swap out the inserts. And for the most part, you will be going through them a lot faster than you will be for drills, which can last for years. And on top of that, you generally will need a lot more than just 10mm cutters. For example, you'll need several different cutter sizes to work with. You'll also need different variations of those cutters with different number of flutes to suit various materials that you might be machining. Two flutes, for example, have more clearance for chips, and I use them for aluminium and plastic. Whilst four flutes are stronger, and I use them in steel. And those are just the basics. Outside of that, there's one flutes, three flutes, five, six, which I almost never buy. I also keep roughing end mills on hand for bulk material removal. You can always spot them because they have this weird wavy pattern on the flutes. I also keep some ball end mills on hand for specific features. I don't use them a whole lot for manual work, but sometimes you do need them for specific jobs. And outside of that, there are even more specialised cutters which you rarely buy, but still you will need to factor them in for when you're buying tools. This includes reduced shank cutters, dovetail cutters, long end mills and T-slot cutters. And that is all before you think about coatings or material type, such as what type of high speed steel or carbide. Now look, I don't want to overcomplicate the process of cutter selection, and many of these have been accumulated over the past 5 years. But my overarching point that I want to convey is that these cutters are expensive consumables. So when you're using them, there's a few things that you may want to consider to get the absolute most from your cutters. And these are some of the tips that I've learned over the past 10 years, which has certainly saved me quite a bit of money when it comes to buying and using end mills. Now my number one tip that I always follow is that when the situation presents itself, skipping end mills entirely and opting to go for a carbide face mill is almost always the way to go. I obviously made this one myself, but you can buy them off the shelf. And more than anything else that I've done in the past five years, this has saved me the most amount of time and money. Not only can you run carbide faster than high speed steel, the tips don't burn up as easily and they are much harder. So you can run them for longer and in much harder material. But most importantly, once the cutting edge breaks, all you have to do is rotate the insert to a new edge or you simply swap out the insert and then you can get back to machining. And whilst an insert may run you three to five dollars a piece, you get four cutting edges per insert, which makes this far cheaper to run than simply swapping out end mills when the end mills get blunt. Now the holder will be a bit expensive, but once you buy the holder and the inserts, it's going to be cheaper to run and you can run it a lot faster. 
The only real problem with it is that it's mostly limited to large roughing and facing passes because the tool is pretty big and it can't get into small spaces. So for small stuff and for small detail work, you will then need to swap over to an end mill. Either way, it is certainly worth the investment. And another great compliment to the face mill will be to keep some roughing end mills on hand. And you can easily tell them apart from normal cutters because they'll have a wavy horizontal pattern on them. And as the name suggests, they're meant for roughing or material removal. Now the normal rule for an end mill is that the end mill is only as good as the state of its cutting edge. So when using them, you want to keep them in as good condition as you possibly can for as long as possible. So there's very little reason to waste those flutes hogging away material when you have a special cutter that is made for it. And these roughing end mills can do much deeper cuts than a regular end mill can do. And that's all down to the geometry of the cutting teeth. And unlike a normal end mill which produce long thin chips, the chips produced by a rougher are short and round. And overall, I found them to be able to remove a lot more material over their working lifespan than you would get from a normal finishing end mill. So they are worth having on hand. And unlike an insert carter like a face mill, these work really well on low horsepower machines, they can get into really small spaces, and they don't throw chips all the way across the workshop. And despite having four flutes, I found that they work really well on aluminium. The only big drawback to them is that they produce a very rough surface owing to the flute pattern, so you will then need to come back and then finish it up with a finishing end mill. As well as that, not every supplier that I use carries these, so the choice in terms of size and flute length can be very limited. And finally, because of the extra surface area of the wave pattern, they produce a lot more heat. Now no matter what, machining will always produce a lot of heat and friction, and heat will ruin most cutting tools, or at the very minimum, it will reduce the life of them. Now in a perfect setup, what you'd like to do is rely on the chip that you're cutting, being able to draw away all the heat from the workpiece and the cutter. And for many small jobs, I do rely on that. But the difference that I saw in tool life, once I switched over to using a coolant or a cutting oil, is simply night and day. Simply because heat will eventually build up in the cutter and the workpiece. And as well as that, cutting oil or coolant reduces friction, which will reduce tool wear. Now of course I'm very fortunate to have a flood system installed for very heavy cuts on the mill, but even just using coolant in a spray bottle makes a huge difference to the tool life of my cutters. The difference really is night and day and I always recommend using it. Now I have been asked what stuff do I use and to put it simply, I use what is ever available at the tool shops that I go to. I'm sure most of them work fine enough. Now because of the flood coolant system, I usually buy these big 5 litre jugs, but typically you can find 1 litre packets for about 10 to 15 bucks. And all this stuff really is, is just a water soluble oil. The mix that I go for is about 10% oil, 90% water, and that's a higher concentration that is usually on the packet, but going with this ratio means that I've never seen any parts rust. And I use this stuff all the time for milling, drilling and lathe work and it more than pays for itself in the amount of tooling that it saves. Just make sure to do this in a well ventilated space because the last thing you want to be breathing in is this stuff once it evaporates. Now the next thing worth talking about is something called recutting chips. And recutting chips is a very fast way to ruin a cutter. Now this is not a huge issue when you're machining the outside or the top of a part, but when you're machining slots or pockets, this can be a particularly bad issue. And what it is, is that the chips aren't effectively being evacuated from the slot or the hole. And as the end mill travels, it picks up and then pulls the chip through the work, effectively recutting it. And what it does is it creates a lot of friction and wear on the cutting edge. Now sometimes it can be very difficult to remove the chips. And depending on the cut, sometimes the chips are pushed in front of the end mill, which then get recut as the end mill travels forward. My go-to solution to try and avoid this is to use a brush to try and brush out the chips. And that usually does a pretty good job. And on occasion, I have used coolant and a shop vac to try and blow the chips out. And compressed air or an air blast is a very popular option, but if I were to do that, I'd want some sort of enclosure because I don't want to be blowing chips around the workshop. So I recommend trying to find the best solution that works for you. Now the next few points on this list deal with a sort of fundamental problem with end mills, which is that the bottom edge will usually see more wear than the top, which means that it usually wears out faster. Now this uneven wear will usually show up as a visible line on parts. The top is still sharp and it cuts, but the bottom is blunt and it starts to rub. So what this pretty much means is that even though the top is still good, it's limited by the bottom which has already been worn. 
And what this means for you is that a chunk of the cutting edge which you have paid for is now being wasted or limited by the bottom being worn. In a similar fashion to this, the bottom edge, since it's almost always being used, is usually the part of the end mill that gets damaged. Now it's not always true, but generally if you are going to have a crash, either the whole end mill is going to break in half or the bottom is going to get damaged. Now because of all of this, there are a few rules that I try to stick to when I use end mills. Now the first rule is to try and maximise deep cuts with a shallow step over, over wide cuts with a low depth of cut. Now obviously this will all depend on the setup and the part, but trying to opt for a deep cut with a shallow step over will let you use a larger percent of the flute and allow you to wear out the cutter more evenly. Case in point, this is some footage that I shot from about 4 years ago and here only the very bottom of the cutter is being used, whilst the rest of the end mill isn't being used for anything. It would be much better to do full depth cuts using shallower step overs. Now obviously there are many cuts where you can't do this, but if you can prioritise it, you'll get much better use out of your end mills. Just make sure to lock the table if you're doing particularly deep cuts, which is a mistake that I've done far too many times. And the end mill starts to climb cuts in the wrong direction. And the result is what you see here. Now this also goes hand in hand with the next point, and that is try to minimise flute length if you can, at least to within reason. Now obviously flute lengths come in various different lengths for different jobs. But if you pick a shorter one, generally it should be a lot more rigid and you can use a higher percentage of the flute length. But on the other hand, it's not going to be as versatile and also not every single supply is going to have every single size in different flute lengths. So you also have to deal with that as well. But generally, if I can go for a shorter flute length, I try to pick them at least to within reason. Now the next point is saying that I'm doing a bit more these days and again it also comes down to availability and price. But something that I'm trying out is that instead of using normal end mills, I'm instead swapping over to using bull nose end mills. Now unlike a normal end mill which features a sharp 90 degree corner, bull nose have a rounded curve at the edge. And some of them will have a large radius and some of them, like the ones that I'm using, have a very small radius. Now the reason why I'm using them is that sharp corners have very little material, so they're easily the first things to break or burn up. Whereas rounded corners tend to last quite a lot longer. I'd like to do a test to see just how much longer tool life that I'm getting from these cutters, but so far I'm pretty happy with using them and I have seen a noticeable increase in the tool life, at least in terms of the tool life for that bottom corner. The only real drawback to them is that you don't get a sharp corner, which can be a good thing because sharp corners lead to concentrations of stress. But the biggest thing holding me back at the moment is availability. They're just less common, especially in the small radius size that I buy. But again, it'll all depend on your suppliers and the tooling companies that you buy from. Another thing that I've done for years is to make use of broken and blunt end mills, which I do all the time. Now the way that I do this is that one of my tool holders always carries a broken or a blunt cutter that still has life left in the top portion of the flutes. And despite my best efforts, I always have some end mills that are broken that still have a lot of life left in the top part of the flutes. And when that's the case, there is no reason to throw out those end mills, because you can always make use of them. So pretty much any time you see me squaring up stock that is less than 15 or 20 mil thick, it's usually being done with an old end mill using the part of the flutes that isn't broken or is still sharp. I've been doing this for years and it is a great way to use tools that may have gone to the scrap bin, and it saves you good tools for when you really need them. Now my second last tip, and it's something that I have mentioned before, is that I try to reserve my sharpest end mills for certain tasks. Now this mostly applies for my two flute cutters, but the way that it works is that I keep the sharpest ones in near perfect condition and I use them exclusively for doing plastics. A lot of plastics tear very easily, or you need a very sharp cutter in order to get a nice polished finish, and as a result the end mills that you use need to be almost razor sharp. Once they get dulled a little bit, they then get used for aluminium. Aluminium still needs to be sharp, but not the same level of sharpness that you need for some plastics. And once those cutters are a little bit too blunt for aluminium, I then swap them out to use them as slotting cutters in steel, which then further degrades the edge. So far for me, it's been a pretty good system, and it's allowed me to get the most out of my end mills. And also in a similar way, I also try to reserve my cutters for different materials based on what the cutter is made from. So to put this simply, my cutters are generally made from four different types of material. So at the very low end, my cheapest end mills are made from something called high speed steel aluminium. And as far as end mills go, they're cheap, they'll cut, and as long as you keep them cool or stick to soft steel or aluminium, these things cut well enough. 
However, these things dull like you wouldn't believe if you try to use them in medium carbon, tool steel or 4140. For example, this brand new Carter only lasted a few minutes before dulling in some 4140 and after that I had to swap to carbide which did the whole job without any issue. I really am trying to phase these out but as long as you stick to mild steel or any other soft metal, they do the job and they are really cheap. With that said, you're better off getting a Carter made from M2 high speed steel which is probably the most common and general purpose of the high speed steel grades. At least for general work on hobby machines, they offer the best trade-off between tool life, performance and price. And they are fantastic for most medium and low carbon steels. Now if the price is right, cobalt high speed steel between 5 and 8% offers much better tool life and heat resistance than your normal high speed steel, but you are going to be paying more for it. Personally, I only buy this stuff if it's on sale, because for the extra money that you are going to be paying for the cobalt, I'd much rather get a solid carbide end mill. Solid carbide end mills, you know, they're truly a remarkable cutter. They machine so much faster than high speed steel and they are so much harder. But unfortunately, they're just so brittle and so easy to break if you do something stupid. Which is why I only try to use them when I need to machine a lot of material and a face mill wouldn't work. Or when I need to remove a lot of material or when I need to machine hard metal. And that usually means machining 4140, stainless steel or some sort of tool steel. Carbide tends to machine that with ease. With M2 or Cobalt, you can be running the risk of accidentally work hardening the steel and killing your tool in about two seconds. Case in point, the very first time that I bought an expensive Cobalt end mill, I had to machine some 316 stainless. And within about five minutes, I hit a work hardened spot, chewed up the cutter, dulled the flutes, and that was $50 gone in the span of a few seconds. I then came in with a carbide end mill, which cost about the same amount, and it did the whole job without any issues. Is that to say cobalt is bad? No. I think cobalt definitely has a place in the world, but at least to me when I'm choosing my end mills, I tend to favour M2 or aluminium high speed steel for my general purpose work, and then switching over to carbide entirely when I'm doing hard to machine steel. And when I stick to those rules, I generally see much better tool life from my tools. And when I don't stick to those rules, generally that's when I see mistakes happen. And those mistakes can be pretty expensive. So if there's one takeaway from this video, it's try and learn from some of my mistakes. Some of those mistakes have been very costly and hopefully it can save you a few end mills as well. And with that, thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you next time.